Hello, this is Brother Samuel Pounds of the Hilltop Church of Christ, again inviting you to another week of our virtual sermon series 101, dealing with the great uh, theme of timeless truth in truthless times. On tonight, we are privileged to hear a message from Dr. Hell Red. Uh, he is the great evangelist from Memphis, Tennessee. He'll be coming in his own way and sharing with us his faith in Jesus Christ. My friend, just reach out to a friend and a neighbor and let them know in regards to this powerful message of Jesus Christ that that's about um, to come forth. And my friend, so after the next song, the voice you hear, Dr. Hal Red of Memphis, Tennessee. Please go ahead and mark your Bibles at Acts 8 and Isaiah 53, and you'll be set to study with us during this sermon series about timeless truth in truthless times. I want to express my deepest appreciation for those who planned this event and to the gospel preachers who have spoken before me and who will speak after me. And special thanks to all of you for attending this series of meetings. Now, need I tell you that the format for this sermon series um, is forced by these unprecedented times. COVID-19 has impacted many aspects of our lives, including religious life and church. And there have been protests and riots and political unrest. And during all of this time, people are sick and hospitals are filling up across the nation and people are dying. It certainly is a time when people need to be saved because they're sick and dying and lost. That's why this meeting is happening, because there are still people, Christian people, who believe Jesus and remember him saying, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Timeless truth for truthless times. This sermon is designed to cause all of us to think about salvation. And I hope it will be used in various ways. I hope some of you will use it to examine your own salvation. I hope others will use it to think about what you're preaching and teaching relative to salvation. And I even want to challenge Christian people to be more diligent in their preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now to our text. You marked Acts chapter 8 and Isaiah 53. And we'll read from Isaiah 53 because it's quoted in Acts 8. As a matter of fact, just for your personal study, let me encourage you to read the second part of Isaiah. Isaiah 40 through 66. And you ought to read it because it's sort of a forerunner of the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
This is how I'm going to approach the sermon. I'll begin by reading Acts chapter 8. Then I'll connect Acts 8 to Isaiah 53. Then we'll make seven observations that the conversion story of the Ethiopian eunuch teaches us about the plan of salvation. And then there are three practical applications, and that will be our sermon for tonight. Acts chapter 8, Isaiah 53 seven observations, and three practical applications. There's a statement in uh, J.W. McGarvey's commentary on Acts. I quote, Acts of the Apostles is a much neglected book. It was so in the days of Chrysostom, who lived in the fifth century and who says, there are many who do not even know that this book is in existence or who can state the name of the author. It is so to this present time and thousands go to other books of the Bible to find that which is the distinctive teaching of this book, the book of Acts and the Bible stories of conversion answer the question, what must I do to be saved? I remember as a younger preacher hearing older preachers make a statement, you're reading somebody else's mail. What they meant is, you wouldn't go to the book of Romans to find out how to become a Christian. And you wouldn't read the book of Acts to find out how to live the sanctified life. Acts, the conversion stories, answer that question. And unfortunately, there are people who have never learned the Bible stories of conversion. So they really do not know what they need to do to be saved. And they don't understand the consistency of the Bible examples that everybody in the Bible, post-cross, got saved the same way. So we hear a lot of rhetoric, really false doctrine, about God saves one person one way and another person another way, and sometimes even Christians raise questions. Brother Ed, how do you know? Perhaps they can be saved another way in another church. And what I'm saying is that's impossible biblically. I'm talking about the Bible plan of salvation. And this sermon is about how to be saved according to the Bible. Now I'm reading in the book of Acts. And I'll begin at verse number 25. They, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Now that verse has little to do with the conversion story that I'm about to talk about. It just has to do with the early Christians' interest in spreading the gospel of Jesus. Peter and John had been to Samaria to help because earlier Philip had gone there preaching the gospel of Christ. And when Peter and John went back home to Jerusalem, on their way, they preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Now to our story particularly, verse number 26 now, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. 
Behold a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was returning and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him, heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life was taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip and the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing, but Philip was found in Azotus and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Now, that reading is very familiar to Christian people. But I doubt it's quite as familiar to the world because the world has not learned the conversion stories. Here we have a pretty complete Bible story of what a man did in order to be saved. Now turn back to the book of Isaiah chapter 53. I hope you will read the entire chapter because I think the eunuch was reading the chapter, the whole chapter. Although what we have referenced in Acts 8 are really verses 7 and 8 of Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was stricken and they made his grave with the wicked but with the rich at his death because he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. Now those are the verses that the Ethiopian eunuch was reading according to Acts 8. But if you read the entire chapter, you'll be impressed with how Isaiah begins verse number 1. He just starts writing, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. 
You see, he doesn't give much background. He doesn't mention Jesus. Isaiah just begins writing about he, him, he, him, him, he, a man, him, he, him. It almost makes you understand why the eunuch asked, who is he talking about? Of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? And Philip began at the same scripture and preached to him Jesus and baptized him into Christ. Now what are some observations that we might make relative to this story in Acts 8 and Isaiah chapter 53. I want to observe seven things. First, the Ethiopian eunuch was a man of great authority. He was a treasurer for the queen. Means he was probably an honest man, but I think we ought to remember when we study salvation that status and authority will not save people. There are a lot of people who are proud of their status. Or perhaps you're a boss over a number of people. But status, authority, importance will not save. Number two, the eunuch had been to worship and was returning, sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah. What does that teach us about salvation? There are many religious people who need to be saved. Worshiping, Bible reading, praying people. People who are morally good people, but not saved because status and authority and moral goodness will not delete sins. And then the Ethiopian eunuch was honest enough to admit that he did not understand what he was reading. Sometimes we need help to understand the scriptures. And we need the honesty and the humility to ask for help if we need it. The eunuch was reading, but he didn't understand the scriptures. He didn't understand the fulfillment of the scriptures in Jesus. He was reading the Old Testament scriptures, but he didn't understand what he was reading. But he did have the humility to ask for help. Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? He said, no. How can I except some man should guide me? And he invited Philip to come up into the chariot and help him understand. Number four, Philip began at the same scripture and preached Jesus. That's what Jesus told the apostles to do, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and common ground in every gospel sermon is the preaching of Jesus. Somehow, somewhere, every gospel sermon, gospel preaching, must include the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus Christ. So Philip began at the same scripture and preached to him, Jesus. Number five, 
Preaching Jesus for salvation necessarily includes preaching about baptism. You'll notice that nothing is said in the reading of Acts 8 about Philip telling him how he needed to be baptized. It just says, Philip began at the same scripture and preached to him Jesus. But I know Philip preached about baptism because Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And then the Bible says, they were riding along, came to a certain water. The eunuch said, see, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? What makes him think he needs to be baptized? Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ includes preaching about baptism. Philip began at the same scripture and preached to him Jesus. And somehow he concluded that he needed to be baptized. I don't know how that would happen, except that in preaching Jesus, we must of necessity tell people what Jesus said they have to do in order to be saved. And then number six, the eunuch made the good confession. He said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And we should still teach people to make that good confession. And every Christian made that confession before he was baptized into Christ. And we still believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that conviction will continue shaping life until Jesus returns. And then finally, Philip buried the eunuch in baptism for the remission of sins. I mean, he literally took him into the water, buried him in baptism. It's one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons people have to be taught that baptism is a burial. They stop the chariot. Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him and they both came up out of the water. Nothing in the Bible about him reaching down into the water and sprinkling some water on his head, finding some kind of container, pouring water on his head. They both went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. He baptized him, and they both came up out of the water. And we've got to keep telling people that if you've been sprinkled for baptism, poured for baptism, then unfortunately you've never been baptized into Christ. I didn't say you're not religious. I didn't say you're not a good moral person. I said if you've been sprinkled for baptism, that baptism is not right. And it's important because this story also teaches us that baptism is essential for salvation. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. An apostle of Jesus wrote, the like figure when the baptism doth also now save us. So if you just take a look at this story of Philip teaching and baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch, you can be impressed with seven observations. The eunuch had great authority. The eunuch was a worshiping Bible reading man he was honest and humble and requested the help necessary to understand Scripture. Philip began at the same Scripture and preached Jesus. The gospel necessitates 
preaching Jesus. That makes baptism necessary. The eunuch made the good confession and Philip baptized him into Christ. Now what are we learning holistically if we put Acts 8 together with Isaiah 53? These final practical applications come from putting the two contexts together. Here's the first one. We ought to appreciate God's strong desire to save us. We're talking about salvation tonight. Sometimes I think God wants to save people more than people really want to be saved. He thinks more about it. He planned for it. And he really wants you saved. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And one of the ways to understand how much God wants us saved is to go back and read in the book of Isaiah. This time, I want you to look back at Isaiah 52 because that helps us put Isaiah in a context. Thus saith the Lord God, verse number four, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there. And the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now when Paul wants to write about the big scheme of salvation, he starts before the foundation of the world. But Isaiah goes back at least to Egypt. And then he says, lately you've been oppressed by the Assyrian context. Let's think about context. Isaiah preached in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. In the sixth year of Hezekiah, God allowed North Israel to be taken into Assyrian exile. Isaiah was still preaching to South Israel, Judah, and telling them that they were going into Babylonian exile. But God would redeem them from Babylonian exile. That helps us understand why Isaiah would say, you came out of Egypt, but lately the Assyrian oppressed you. And he keeps right on preaching. But you're going into Babylonian Exile. Think about context and dates. If Isaiah preached in the sixth year of Hezekiah's reign when the Assyrians took north Israel, that's 722 BC. He's still predicting that they're going into Babylonian captivity that happened in 586 BC. And a big part of Isaiah's message is about restoration. God planned to restore them from Babylonian exile. There's a concept called already not yet. It's something that's future, but we're treating it like it's already happened. Much of Isaiah, especially the last part, is already not yet. Because he writes like God has delivered them from Babylonian captivity, and, and they haven't even gone into Babylonian captivity. Because he's writing in the 700s, they go 586 B.C., now, this is what I want you to appreciate. From 722 B.C. back to Egypt, 
past Babylonian captivity all the way to the cross of Jesus Christ. As Isaiah preaches, he, he has a lot to say about Israel's sins and the wrath of God. But what he shows us is God is looking past Israel's sins. He's going to punish them for sure, but past their sins, restored from Babylonian captivity, the temple rebuilt in 516, Shealtiel, Pedadiah, Zerubbabel rebuilt the temple, Abiah, Eliakim, Azar, Zadok, Achim, Eliath, Eliezer, Matthew, Jacob, Joseph, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and Philip met a eunuch who said, what's this man talking about? Who is he talking about? And Philip began at the same scripture and preached Jesus. So that while God's people were going into Babylonian exile, Jesus was in the plan for man's salvation. The second thing that I want you to appreciate is the gospel is for all. The same gospel for everybody. And one of the ways we can get to that is by understanding that God was not just casting his people off. In Isaiah 49, verse number 6, Isaiah writes, It's too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And I want to suggest with that that God was not just looking at the cross. He was looking at the church because all through the end of Isaiah, he keeps promising, I'm going to make you some kind of light for the Gentiles. I'm going to draw all nations. I'm going to draw the Gentiles. And by the time you get to the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, he says, was God casting off his people? God was not casting off his people. He cast off his people to graft in the Gentiles so the whole world could be saved. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And the only time in the Bible, Jews and Gentiles are grafted into one body is when they're grafted in one body through the death of Jesus Christ to make the church of Christ. And every saved person will have to be a member of the church of Christ. How does a person become saved? He becomes saved the same way he becomes a member of the church. How does he become a member of the church? The same way he's saved. And that's not optional for Jew or Gentile. It's the same gospel. The gospel is for all. You can't obey one gospel and I obey another gospel and somebody else obeys a, another gospel. There's one gospel, one plan for salvation. It's for Jews and Gentiles alike. All nations can be saved through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think we have to be careful in our world about making it sound like 
there's more than one plan for salvation. It's really not true that one person can accept Jesus Christ in his heart and pray a sinner's prayer. It's really not true that you can go down to the altar and fetch religion and be saved some man-made way. Really not true. Every example of conversion in the Bible follows the same plan. And I've challenged people through the years, if you could really be saved another way, wouldn't there be an example of somebody doing it like that in the Bible? We're talking about how to be saved according to the Bible. And every story of conversion that you read will follow the pattern of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, the story that we've already read. Every person who is saved has to obey the same plan. I had to obey the same plan Paul had to obey. And you'll have to obey the same plan we obeyed in order to be saved. The gospel is for all, and there's one gospel for the world. And then finally, the primary goal of this earthly pilgrimage is heaven. And Isaiah shows us that. In Isaiah chapter 65, Isaiah writes, See, I will create new heavens and new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will not be heard in it anymore. A person could reason that he's talking about the return from Babylonian captivity, and certainly I think that would be included. But I think it's deeper than that. Because years after John wrote in the Revelation, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. In the Revelation, what Isaiah wrote becomes a euphemism for heaven itself. So we talk about before the foundations of the world, into human history, and then after this world, a new heaven and a new earth. And the goal of this pilgrimage is to make sure we go to heaven when we die. Old people used to sing a song, I wouldn't mind dying if dying was all. It's that when we die, however we die, for whatever reason, we still got to live eternally somewhere. So Paul's reasoning, I want to attain the resurrection. I want to know Christ so well that I attain the resurrection, that I'm resurrected to live with him eternally. There are good observations that we might make about conversion from the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. But when we see the background, we add, oh, how God wants to save us. One gospel, same gospel, 
for Jews and Gentiles. And one primary focus of this pilgrimage needs to be what happens to us after we die. I'm wanting to remind Christian people of their responsibility to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you remember I told you earlier that when Peter and John went back to Jerusalem, as they were going, they were preaching in all the villages and the cities around Samaria. And then Acts 8 ends. Philip baptized the eunuch into Christ. They both came up out of the water, and the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more. The eunuch went on his way rejoicing, and then the chapter closes. Philip was found in Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. This is the responsibility of Christian people. Sometimes I think we get kind of spiritually lazy. We begin to think because I'm a Christian and saved and going to heaven, everything's all right. It's not all right just to be a Christian. You've got to live a holy life, and you have the responsibility to help spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to encourage all of you to seek the Lord. That's why I like the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 55, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the unrighteous man forsake his unrighteousness and seek the Lord. Perhaps you're seeking the Lord. Perhaps this message has caused you to want to seek him more. You can be a Christian if you obey the Bible plan of salvation. You've got to believe in Jesus. Repent of your sins. Make a confession with your mouth and be buried with Christ in baptism. Lord, I see man, man standing by the Jordan. Why didn't he? Why didn't he?